There's a wallet on the ground where the alley joins the street, stuffed with bills. You pick it up and glance around, spotting a man on his hands and knees in the alley. Excuse me, I appear to have lost my glasses. They're on the ground just behind him. You snag him before he crushes them with an errant knee. Oh, thank you, thank you. He scans the alley. You, uh, didn't find my wallet, too, did you? You shake your head. Rats. Well, thanks for your help anyway. He turns, then hesitates. You know, I had a ticket to see the new movie at the plaza. Not in the mood after all this. Please, take it. For your help. Your seat is plush and comfortable. The crowd chats excitedly around you. You settle in for the movie. The first few scenes play out fairly predictably. It appears to be a romantic comedy about golf. The crowd seems largely disinterested. Their prior enthusiasm muted abruptly. The scene shifts from the dancing and grand ceremony to a shot of a grubby alley. People start sitting up in their seats. It takes you a second to realize you're looking at yourself. You stoop to pick up the wallet, then see the man. The crowd grows tense as you hand him his glasses. The booing starts when it's clear you're going to keep the wallet. The audience turns on you, hissing and jeering. You awkwardly work your way out of your row and head for the exit. When was the last time you ever prayed? For me, it feels like a lifetime. My hands, I, I never thought I'd see my hands so worn, off, and yellow from the calluses. There's a sting like fiery needles like surging through my fingers. When my hands meet, the pain grows hotter and leaner. And my arm muscles contract as if they wish to rip through the skin. And yet, when these hands are picking fruit from the ground, the pain cruelly leaves. Un dolor y bien desentados. A dollar twenty in the absence of a prayer. I never thought I'd see myself like this. Maybe you have a good hopeful story to tell? What a good story. I will remember it for a while. I know. Joy, mijo, my son, or at least my memory of him, keeps me going. I forget how long it's been. I wonder sometimes at what age does one start forgetting and stop forgetting. I hope when I see him again, he will understand. I hope. Please share a story of hope with me. What is worse, to have your flesh and blood rob you of your true dreams, or to have a lover drown them in the lake of Enema? Either way, you're at the mercy of conniving men. I pray that my son will grow up far away from such evils. Now, tell me a funny story. Make me laugh.
Hmm, family. There's my mother, my aunts and uncles from her family. Oh, I miss them dearly. Especially the cookouts, the few my father let us attend. I learned to dance from my cousins, so young and filled with energia. I miss them all dearly. Maybe you have a good hopeful story to tell? What a wonderful story. We need stories like this to give us strength. Home, Ecuador. I remember it so clearly. The people and their homes were built from the same mold. Vibrant but rough in the inside. Mi padre said it just reminded him of me. And for once in his life, he was right. Do you know anything funny? Anything I can write home about to me? It is through my faith in him that I'm still here. Though there are times where I wonder if he sees us. Well, here is the sun. I must get ready to walk again. I'm going this way. New fields, new work. Besides, you must be tired of listening to me. I'm already talking like una anciana, an old woman at the edge of her deathbed. What about you? How do you make sense of your life? Stranger, share a cup. 
These women are enjoying a tale, passing around a bottle of brown liquor. You take a swig to wash the tang of poultry farming from your nostrils. So I told him, you better go get those turkeys back, the heavyset matron tells her audience. We got some feathers, some glue, a poncho, and a fan for a tail, and we dressed up Rodney as the finest turkey man you ever saw. So he's out there strutting, trying to save his prized turkeys from going AWOL. Now who come up the road? Horace from across the way. You know what Horace said? What? A farm wife calls. He said you don't need no radio with all this fine entertainment right next door. The women howl. Lost all them birds, except for Lola. Poor thing, she took a liking to Rodney. Followed him day and night. But she had no way of making any eggs or being of much use to us. She made an annoying pet, but she made a fine casserole. To the sand. My legs gave out, my body lacked the strength enough to stand. The horsemen moved upon me then, their leader to my side. A woman crouches in this meadow, making quick, fine strokes on a fresh page in her notebook. She gives you a small, careful smile. Want to see what I'm working on? She beckons you closer, and you see a flower half-finished on the first page of her book. As you watch, though, she moves quickly to the next page and begins to draw the cluster of tangled stamens inside it. She speeds up. She flips to the next page and draws a minuscule bug nestled between the flower's delicate innards. Flip. Next page. Now she's drawn its eye. It blooms across the page in under three seconds, as real as anything. Now she's drawn some weird cluster of stringy filaments. Is this the surface of the bug's eye? But she's on to the next page, faster than ever. Fingers a blur as they spread a tangle of dots and lines. Flip. Next page. Dots and blurs woven together. Incoherent. Nothing you've ever seen before. Flip. Next page. A new tangle of dots and blurs. Weird and familiar. Flip. Next page, a cloudy orb in a sea of black flops out of her pencil like as if by accident, and she's already turning to the next page. A continent, flip, terrain, flip, a meadow with two dots in the middle, and flip, your head, her head, the flower. The artist takes your hands and hold them tight. Hers are stinging hot like a truck hood after a long drive. It always wraps back around, she whispers in your ear. No matter how far I go, I'm always coming home. As you approach the farmhouse, a flock of crows lands in the field ahead. A wave of anguish washes over you, and when the world snaps back into focus, a man stands amongst the crows. Death has come to this place. I am here for the deceased. As he speaks, two crows fly out from the farmhouse towards him each carrying a large rectangle of colorful cloth. Four boys came out here to have some last peace. The two boys who lived there, lovers who lived as they died. Too young, with the world turned away from them. Finally taken by the illnesses they could not fight. He 
takes a cloth from the birds, panels like tapestries, names stitched into them. He holds them up. Their names, the stories of their lives told by those who loved them, to be added to the quilt of all the others. Thousands to remember the tragedy, the terror, the grief. The entire generation we lost. Too many will forget. We cannot forget what was allowed to happen. Tell the story, traveler. Pup is a skinny thing, but its eyes are bright, its fur is shiny, and its tail thumps the ground eagerly at your approach. It won't come at your call. Instead, looks around as if worried that acknowledging you would mean betraying another. The dog isn't tied up or injured, must be well trained to sit so patiently. With a noise between a huff and a bark, it bounces to its feet when a small boy comes into sight. The child is ill-dressed and dirty and grinning like a fiend. Lion, you're so good. He shrugs. Dunno, really. Wherever our feet take us. He scratches Lion's chin. The dog quivers with pleasure. Lion's a circus dog. I was thinking about finding him a town, trying to earn money showing his tricks, but I don't think he'd be happy. The boy inflates with pride. All right, he won't get shy as there's just us. He turns to Lion and looks deep into the dog's eyes. Lion, please will you find me a hat? Lion can fetch anything. He understands lots of words. The boy shrugs. Mainly he fetches stuff I can sell. It's a living. We never take anything important. His expression is guilty, but not repentant. The boy grins. Barking announces the return of Lion. He's got a fedora on his head. It's tilted rakishly. The dog scampers to its owner, who transfers the hat from Lion's head to his own. Isn't he good? We'll get by. There's nothing we can't do together. slant under the bright colored bird. Maybe that's why he stands with a cane. Man and bird watch your approach with interest. Howdy, stranger, says the man. Howdy, stranger, croaks the bird. The man shifts his shoulder, bobbing up the bird. Rosalie here tells fortunes. There's pride in his voice. Ain't no other like her. Care to hear yours? Just a single coin. Your coin disappears into the man's jacket. He jingles one pocket, then scratches Rosalie at the back of her bill. She rasps. The greatest burdens on your road are the ones you choose to carry. The man cracks a smile. 
Make of it what you will. <laughs> I like to think it means our lives get easier when we forgive ourselves. She's a smart bird, is Rosalie. The man tips his hat. Good luck on your way. The man checks a wristwatch and swears under his breath. His fingernails have been chewed down to the skin. <laughs> Bus is late, he says without looking at you. The man looks confused by your question. Upon inspection, the tickets in his hand show a stamp and receipt of sale, but the destination is obscured. The man looks at the tickets in his hand as if he hadn't known they were there. Slowly, some comprehension colors his expression. Somebody came and went. Just fine, just fine, neighbor. Bus will be here soon. He starts to bite at his fingers again. Surely there can't be any nail left to chew. The man pops his knuckles one finger at a time and starts over. When a wren lands nearby and sings a little, you're grateful for the sound. Looks like the cat staked its claim. Share a meal with me? It asks, swinging tail brushing the corpse. He's still partly fresh. It has been a while since you last ate. Can't be choosy in hard times. You sit with the cat and roast the horse flesh over a fire. It's tender meat. It was a beautiful horse, not much older than a colt. Ever been in love? The cat, making small talk. Have you ever loved someone so much that you could not bear to think of life without them? If you did truly love someone like that, and they didn't know it, and you were brave enough to tell them, and they rejected you, do you think you would be able to just move on? Then how can that love have ever been that important to you? The cat scoffs. I couldn't let go of something like that. I wasn't able to. But he's inside me now. And you too. Brothers stroll up to you in the street, wearing identical scowls and identical steel-toed boots. One spits in front of you. Don't stay in town overnight, the other says. No vagrants after dark. There's no shelter to find on the road, and the night is cold and windy. You doze fitfully under a bush. But at least you're in one piece come morning. In this plaza, jacaranda trees nestle among adobe structures. A man sits in the shade of the largest one, plucking notes on his guitar. Wind rustles their branches and stirs up sounds of shouting, truncheons on flesh. An old woman fanning herself looks up at the noise. The melody is mournful. In the song, a man bids a tearful farewell to his wife and son 
as he's rounded up and forced onto a train to a country he has never seen. When the last notes fade, the only sound is the wind sighing through the jacarandas. You turn the corner and see a large gathering of whites and orientals crowding around a happy couple. Joyful pyrotechnics like gunfire snap along the pavements. The woman is white in a pristine lace dress. The man is Chinese in an ornate red gown. There's no mistaking their happiness from their vibrant grins. Two white women in the back of the crowd gossip loudly. Oh, the poor Ryber girl. I cannot believe she decided to marry an Oriental, said the woman in blue. The woman in red scoffs at the remark. I thought it was illegal. The woman in blue responds. No, my dear, you're thinking of Mongols. This Yang here is a Chinese. Is there a difference? The woman in red asks rhetorically as she turns and sees you listening. The woman in red continues. Chinese or not, this wedding is a danger to this community. An old man in white stripes steps over and adds to the conversation. I don't see how someone could marry a Chinese. He shakes his head. Can you imagine what their children will look like? The firecrackers come to an end, causing the quidnunks to disperse. You watch the happy couple serve hot tea to their elders, bow, and walk toward your direction. You make way for the couple, but the Chinese groom stops and gently inquires. That's right. They're distant relatives who traveled far by train to come celebrate with us today. I wanted to greet them, but it seems like they've left before I had the chance. Say, friend, how do you reckon? Were they happy with our union? I see. That's too bad. I suppose the most I can do is wish them well on their travels back home. Thank you for your honesty, friend. Please, stay as long as you like and enjoy our celebration. You've been in California long? It's been a few years for me, but they still call me Oki. I came west when our farm stopped growing anything but a crop of dust. But when we got here, there were so many others here before us. Maybe you've got less need behind you. I hope so, for your sake. Anyway, know any good hopeful stories to share? I could sure use one. That's a good one. I'll try to remember it when I'm out in the fields. Joy. Oh, when we first heard they were looking for workers in California. <laughs> that was joy. We thought we'd get here and have our own home right away. And no dirt floor either. Mm, I've had a hard day. Do you know any hopeful stories to cheer me up? expect me to take that seriously? 
I had trust. The way my mother raised me. Someone comes to your door, you give them a bite to eat and a place to sit down. <laughs> Made me think the world was full of people who'd do that for you. But when the dust starts blowing off the ground, the hospitality goes away with it. I had to learn no one was gonna do that for me, and I couldn't afford to do it for them either. Mm, I've had a hard day. Do you know any hopeful stories to cheer me up? Are you trying to make me laugh? Choice? <laughs> Most of us don't have many choices what we do. We don't have enough to give away. Anyway, I'm looking for a good laugh. My sides hurt. Authority. Being in charge means you pick which people you're not gonna look after. Things got bad. The first thing the big owners did was shove the tenant farmers off their land with tractors. Can't much argue with an all us chalmers. Been so long since I last chuckled, I'm not sure my mouth can do it anymore. moment just to catch my breath. Death. Yeah, I seen death. Back home we used to have a big cattle barn. Along comes a twister and picks that barn right up a half a mile in the air. What rains back down is all little pieces of wood with nails in them. After we'd been here a while, my husband wanted to go back to Oklahoma. But I knew there was nothing for us there anymore. I said I wasn't going back there to starve to death. So he took the girls and went without me. And now, I'm going my own way. Down the road this way, actually, to the next job. On and on and on. What about you? Where are you going? What are you leaving behind? Times was different then. Not long after you walked into the small, cramped saloon, you found yourself caught by this man, a portly old grifter, sat upon an armchair, seemingly placed there just for him. He takes a deep drag from his cigar. Used to have a trunk full of pawn shop violins. He smiles conspiratorially at you. No doubt, this is his default smile. No harm in explaining how it works now, is there? People today don't go for it. You walk into a diner and eat breakfast. Breakfast's the important part. 
He chuckles for emphasis. And then you get the bill and act surprised when you can't find your wallet. So you put the violin down as collateral while you go back to your car and get it. And that's where the shill comes in. Ah, never mind. I think everybody knows how this goes now. Point is, you sell a $2 violin to someone who thinks it's a $50 violin. The burpee laughs, dismissing a sad thought you can't discern. Isn't it obvious? I ran out of pawn shop violins. Two men sit in the shade, exchanging insults. The first says, That's a low blow, even for one like you. The second responds, One like me? But you're the cheating, lying son of a... The first sighs and shakes his head. No, that doesn't sound right. His tone is oddly jovial. Hmm, good point. How about, you're a scoundrel and a thief? Nah, don't think you can carry it off. Not with your accent. Could just call you a c You often do. Oh, the man looks almost bashful. Just practice and see. Not gonna play you, so no harm in saying. He glances at his brother. We're good at cards, but unlucky at them. Don't see it hurts to rig the game a little. We're working on a distraction. Perhaps you could have benefited from their foresight. Or perhaps this is foolishness. They are, at least, unlikely to meet your old opponent. suddenly become conscious of something heavy in the air. The light of the cigarette breaks the darkness. In its glow, you see the face. Something inside you wishes you hadn't. ¿Quieres esto? He rasps. Then, cigarette. Right. He nods. Live longer. He leans to snub out the cigarette, and his whole body starts to dissolve. You watch him disintegrate until all that remains is a disquieting pile of, well, bone meal? The bone meal carcass of the cigarette-smoking stranger isn't nice to eat. 
After a couple mouthfuls, you move onwards, feeling interestingly better than before. The neon gilded main streets thronged with revelers. He passed beneath a glittering marquee onto a dazzling casino floor. A croupier stands behind a red and black wheel, wearing a spotless suit and an easy smile. He winks as you approach. Care to place a bet? He grins at you. Snag-toothed smile. Black or red then, stranger? Outside bet. Even odds. He spreads his hands, the ball pinched between forefinger and thumb. Nothing but the tick-clack of wood as the ball jumps from red to black and back again. It comes to rest on red. Your lucky day, stranger. The croupier grins. Pass it on, yeah? Lots of folks around here who want it. A pair steps up to take your place. All on black. Here's a derelict school building, shutters nailed shut, wind-drifted dunes piled against the walls, broken desks lined up in the basketball court. While you rest on the front porch, the door is open and someone gives a startled yelp. He's an older man, tidy and unshaven, carrying a toolbox in one hand and brandishing a broom in the other. Don't squat here, he growls. We're not abandoned. You book it across the baseball diamond. He doesn't follow. And when you reach the road, you look back and see him pacing in the basketball court, teaching to the rows of empty desks. wings cutting across the sliver of sky you can see framed by the crowns of vast redwoods. But it's gotten closer. The cry that echoed from afar now seems dangerously near. And suddenly, the eagle swoops down, claws splayed before it, wings spreading into a crescent of knife-sharp feathers. It dives at you like a bomber biplane, body contracting into a bullet racing groundward. You tell yourself you won't flinch. Something soft and incredibly fast brushes against your face. 
When you open your eyes, the eagle is climbing toward the sky already. A little forest mouse caught in one claw, wrinkled tail flapping in the wind. in an evergreen clearing, blood spattered around its maw, one enormous paw still buried in the flesh of the man sprawled beneath it. The grizzly spots you. Even at this distance, you can see its yellowed fangs. Slowly, deliberately, it begins to advance on you. You drop to your knees, curling into a ball. The only noises you can hear are your breathing and the bear's warning grunts. The bear's rancid breath is hot on your neck as it sniffs you. After what feels like an eternity, it wanders away. You remain still as the light fades. Eventually, you dare to move. It's just you and the dead man in the clearing. It looks dressed for a day foreclosing property, not trudging through the forest. The company here is unsettling, with him dead and you playing so. Your knees make a nasty, cracking sound with every step. Wandering this infernal city of steep hills takes its toll. Just over the crest of one hill, you find a stopped truck. Yang Chow. Fresh fruit and vegetables. It's laden with colorful produce. You know anything about engine? Asked a man obscured by the raised triangular hood of the truck. You come around next to him. One glance tells you that there's nothing obviously wrong with the engine, but there's smoke coming from somewhere deep behind and beneath it. The gearbox, maybe. Ah, never mind. He just slams down the hood of the truck, wisps of smoke leaking out of it. He sits on the edge of the truck bed, and you get a good look at him. He's tall, well-built, fans himself with his Panama hat. Sent my brother over to get a real mechanic, but, well, I can barely keep this running as it is. Wish I still had the farm. He sighs theatrically, surprising himself with his own easy honesty. Sam Liang. Landless, broke, truck driver. Dad would have been proud. My old man was, well, he was old. Guys like him didn't get a lot of chances to start a family. He glances around the upwards parabola of the hill, at the placid row houses around you. I was just a kid when it happened. The 06 quake. I can still remember. Barely. margins of redwoods, vanishing their high crowns. A strong musk, reminiscent of a gasoline spill, makes your eyes water. Behind distant sets of trees, a titanic silhouette lurches past. Broken lines of blood blotch the stranger's footprints. You come upon a maimed elk whose sundered antlers have left behind patches of exposed tissue. 
The sediment-covered corpse seems to have been dragged some considerable distance. The silhouette of the stranger looms at the edge of visible forest. You feel the weight of their eyes upon you. The stranger watches, silent and unmoving, while you step backwards the way you came. Even after you've lost sight of their form, their glowing eyes hang in the fog. A weathered man unties a fishing boat from its mooring. You heading out to fish? Can rent your boat if you like. The lake's well stocked, but there's a monster in the lake. Locals say it's the biggest trout ever to live. But they're wrong. It's not a fish. It's something else. And I'm going to be the one to catch it. Someone passes a beer into your hand. Waves of chatter wash over you as you listen to the fishermen's stories. Will's been chasing that fish for years now, man tells you. I don't think you'll ever catch it. It's good fun to watch him try. Eventually, the convivial chatter is broken by a huge splash. Willie floats in the middle of the lake, his boat upturned, his cap bobbing gently several feet away. Almost had him that time! He splutters through a mouthful of water. Almost had him! Presses her fingers into the man's shoulder. Watch! The train pounds past, throwing up thick and suffocating dust. For several minutes, the world is nothing but a cloud. It settles to reveal the two, now painted orange with filth. Making sure he understands. She looks at the man. Do you? He nods. Come back tomorrow, an hour earlier. He nods again, glances warily at you, and then runs away. The girl stares at you appraisingly. You ain't escaped. You're not with the law. Why are you here? She snorts. Lucky. She smiles. It's a bright crescent against the ochre dirt. I have a duty. I run the route. I get people out of this shithole. It means I can't leave. At this band, the trains have to slow. If you've got enough layers on and you know when to jump, get aboard without breaking much. I know all the timings. The look she gives you is combative. If I showed you how, would you take it? A train to anywhere? You don't like losing control? She pauses for a long moment. You ever wonder how you'll cope when it's taken from you? She looks away. I think that happens to everyone eventually. It doesn't make it easier. She walks away and does not look back. The candles flicker as she waves one hand over the ball. Silver mist swirls up inside it. The tent feels closer around you. 
Her eyes study you intently as she sets the orb on the table. Tell me what you see, and I will guide you. She leans forward. Yes? Her eyes widen. Someone long lost. Do they have black hair down to here? She gestures. And skin like mine. She leans forward, knuckles whitening over the edges of the table. What more do you see? Her face creases into a smile. That means I'll see them again soon. That they've forgiven me. She laughs, long and joyful, leaning back in her chair. Take this. She passes you a coin. It's only proper. Thank you. Those three days right from Tulsa in Brown Santa Fe. And there beneath the blazing sun my horse began to sway. Was then I heard the thunder sound come rising. This church's doors stand open. You wander in to ask for a glass of water. There's no preacher, only a disheveled music teacher and a class of young men picking out body songs on the organ. The group can't hear you over an improvised erotic limerick shouted over an equally indelicate tune. The verses escalate in depravity until the music finally swells and comes to the grand finale. Smiling, the teacher invites you to a seat in the pews. A boy returns with water and cookies. And as you eat, the group sings a song about genitalia in perfect three-part harmony. Those four days ride from Tulsa Bang! The screen door clangs in the wind. Downstairs, you hear low murmurs. The wind again? Or voices? You are sure this house was deserted. In the living room, two young women are entwined atop a sleeping bag. One has her hands tangled in the other's bright red hair. I can't believe we found another haunted house. The red-haired girl has jumped up between you and her companion, but relaxes her stance at your words. Well, if you're talking, you probably aren't a ghost, the blonde says. The red-haired girl looks to her, and then back towards you. What are you doing here? The other girl draws up straight. We, emphasizing the word, are having an adventure. The red-haired girl squeezes her hand. She turns back to her companion, her eyes shining. Your presence goes unnoticed as the two resume their hushed conversation. the only respite from the rain outside. Enormous trees dwarf even the largest buildings and homes here, and the inn is no exception. No one is behind the bar. The quiet of the night is broken by the sound of glass crashing into the floor. A huge black tomcat, its coat taking on a moonlit sheen laps experimentally at the high-proof hooch that had just spilled. You try to lean over the cat to pet it, but something about the malevolent way he stares at you gives you pause. You light a match to see by in the darkness, but you still nearly trip on her. A woman, presumably the landlady, her eyes gone glassy and foggy, and on her chest, that damned cat 
snout to her face. been precariously raised as a tiny jetty over a creek, cutting its way through the woods. She's dressed in a simple baby blue dress of the same cloth as her daughter's. Both are bent at the waist, staring into the clear water. It fell somewhere in here. It can't have gotten far. She has the rocky voice of a distraught person who's unused to being distraught. Hey, you! She runs toward you, looking through displaced locks of wavy black hair. Do you see my ring down there in the water? Your eyes scan the bottom of the water, looking for a glint of metal among the moving shimmers of tiny, silver-scaled fish. You reach down into the water, gingerly grasping a narrow band of gold. Oh, Lord, thank you so much! She beams, all but stepping into the water to take it from you. If you hadn't come around, I'd have lost my grandmother's ring. The ring's magical. The young girl blurts out. Her mother gives her a mock, stern look, as though the daughter has just given away a big secret. You drop it in the river, and it grants a wish. The mother laughs shaking the water from her hair. Why, I wished a stranger would roll into town with some stories. The Chinook salmon, having come to the end of its journey, is a grotesque beast. A great curved hump on its back, and that deformed hook of a jaw. The raven perched on it is unusually large, with a fat tuft of black feathers wrapped round its neck like a mane. With one practiced peck, it strikes at the salmon's blurred eye and pops it like a grape snapping open under your teeth. After tasting the fluid inside, it turns toward you, beady black eyes glinting and dying. Suit yourself. It steadies itself on the carcass. People stories, eh? It tries to preen a stray feather back into place, but it only ends up more crooked. What's so great about people? You should collect raven stories. My well, this one's a secret. It flaps its wings and flies towards you, perching on your shoulder. You see, there once was this raven who liked to... You flinch and close your eyes instinctively, losing your balance and taking an ungainly fall onto the soft sand of the riverbed. Ah! cries the raven, once again perched on the dead salmon. splintering crack of old growth breaking. A tall, broad man looms in the clearing. He casts a shadow almost as long as the trees. A handful of other men gaze at him with admiration. 
A slate blue bull stands to the side, slowly chewing on a patch of grass. God damn! Shouts the second largest man, scratches his beard. Come on, stranger, give it a shot. Try your arm against old Paul here. He gestures to an axe lying atop a jagged stump. A couple laughs flow through the crowd. You strike out at a reedy spruce. The axe thwacks into the trunk and roots there. You wrench it out and swing again. Your rhythm is shattered by wood splintering. Your opponent has just cut through two thick evergreens growing close together in one fluid movement. Thwack, thunk, thwack. The huge lumberjack is cutting a circle around you, barely stopping to let one tree fall before he strikes another. The bearded man shakes his head, watching with amusement. Another lumberjack claps him on the shoulder. At last, your tree falls. The bearded man steps forward and shakes your hand. Don't feel bad. No one can match him. I'm not even sure he's human. He looks at the woodcutter, now scratching the ox's ears. You gave it your best. That counts for something. stands on the street corner, fixing a look of refined disdain on everyone who walks past. He sidles closer to you. You aren't from around here. Holes need to get dug. Fence posts, you know, on my estate. Great. Good. This way. He takes you down an alley where a car is parked. You think this is a fucking joke? This dapper little peddler shifts restlessly from foot to foot beside his cart, wringing his hands and glancing around as if he's in some kind of mild agony. He flips you a quarter and hurries off down the road. The man grabs you by the arm. Yep. No matter how you protest, but someone puts a flame Acacia trees nestled at the riverbank. A woman's weeping is just barely audible over the sound. We see horse, she cries. We see horse. She crouches in the shadows, 
a long white dress buoyed by the gentle current. Her face is veiled by the same fabric. Two boys, their hair soaked, their expressions peaceful, lie on the muddy shore. As you turn your back on the tragic tableau, a twig snaps beneath your feet and her head swivels. Have you seen my children? She demands. I didn't mean to hurt them. I thought I found them, but they were lies. The boy's lips are growing blue. I need to find my children. Please, she begs. Help me find my children. She lifts the embroidered veil. Beneath the ivory silk, you catch a glimpse of long black hair. As you turn away, she screams. Her jaw unhinges. Rolls of choya needles protrude from her gums. cookhouse is in disarray. She shakes off the suds. As you sit, her fire-tanned face cracks into a smile of her eyes widen. The heat stings as you... He seemed off in his own little world, idly strumming and muttering along in tune. He stops and calls out to you from his perch on the sidewalk. What's your name? He winks. Now watch this. He sings, baby won't you please come home, but with your name in the lyrics. Now, he says, if you found that meant something to you, and you want to show some of that appreciation, I sure would be obliged. I'm mighty obliged. I can see you got the flower prints in your heart. You're about to ask what he means, but his confidential nod suggests that's the end of the conversation. You pass a meadow where migrants have made a campsite. It's been trampled to pieces. A few families are fleeing, running as fast as they can back up to the roadside. An enormous bull stretches himself beside some of their squashed supplies. The bull locks an eye with you and blinks long and slow. Workers cluster outside a dilapidated church. A heavy set man, the man leaning on the jack. Well, hey there. What's happening, stranger? Pull up a seat if you want to share. I guess my deal is pretty clear. You probably see a hundred long-haired, bangle-wearing freaks on the road every day. We're the only ones still hitching around, I guess. Bummer. Because this is a beautiful place when you take the time to smell the flowers, huh? You know, I'd love to hear a really good, scary story.
Oh, wow, that's scary stuff. You are really good at telling these. My past. Well, my parents didn't abuse me or anything. We just disagreed. We still do. I mean, I assume. So anyway, got any good ghost stories? Anything scary or weird? Oh man, that's really good. Good and scary, I mean. Yeah, free love. That's what it was all about. That's what filled my dreams as a teen. Why couldn't everyone see that we were all just here to love each other? So anyway, got any good ghost stories? Anything scary or weird? Oh wow, that's scary stuff. You are really good at telling these. Talking about sadness. I didn't even know what sadness was until I heard James had died. I had been angry before. Petulant, pouty, heartbroken. But that was all so thin compared to what I felt when I knew he was gone. So, got any good hopeful stories? Anything about what the world should be? Oh, that's good. I'll share that one when I get back home. Faith. Oh, I had it. A certain kind, anyway. I knew there had to be something else out there. Love, peace, and most of all, understanding. Somewhere there were people who thought the way I did, and they'd take me in and we'd live in beautiful harmony together. But anyway, what's the most exciting story you got? Oh, that's a totally wild story. <laughs> it's a blast hearing you tell it. My travels. Well, I've been on the road a while now, but I didn't get to travel as a kid. Not really. We moved a bit when my dad was in the army, but all base towns are pretty much the same. The first time I left was to go to the hate. Well, there it is. And I feel like I've been doing all the talking. But the sun's coming up soon, so I gotta get ready to go. Heard some interesting stuff about a group of folks getting by up this way. And where are you going? What's your deal, Seeker? What's the future hold for you?
there's a commotion outside the post office. The crowd parts, and a middle-aged man comes leaping out onto the curb. My daughter had a baby, he shouts. She had a baby girl. In a fit of frantic excitement, he kicks over the post office box, knocks over a bench, and seizes you at random in a bear hug. Somebody call my wife, he shouts over your shoulder. Tell her we're taking the train to Chicago. The man starts to dance. His feet hit the pavement so hard they throw up puffs of shattered stone. Everyone staggers. When he swings around the lamp post, the metal bends like soft clay. You grab the man by the shoulders to shake some sense into him, but he mistakes your gesture for an invitation to dance. He swings you around so hard you fly across the road and into the ditch. Everyone in town is running for the hills. As you flee down the road, you see him, two hands overhead, lift a car and hurl it ten yards down an alley. Lordy, if this is what the grandfather can do on a good day, what must the baby be like? man wears a fine cotton suit, clean as a whistle, like the dust and dirt of travel just don't stick. Could I have a moment, traveler? A kindness for your fellow man. As you draw closer to him, a vibrant fragrance enriches your nostrils. Notes of jasmine, citrus, and is that sandalwood? No. Birch tar. Have you seen a jailbird around? Usual black and white stripes. A woman. The man doesn't elaborate much. She has a debt to settle. That's all. I have coins for your trouble. did she now? Hard to find such honest folks in these times. You blink, and the man is no longer there. Your pockets feel heavier. On top of a hillside boxcar, four men in sailors' clothes fix their eyes on the distant waterfront, where a crowd of hundreds clashes with uniformed cops. From the After a while of silence, one of the men responds. You notice his bruised eye. <laughs> Waiting on the police to deal with those strikers so we can get back to work. The man seems nervous and fills the silence. Those longshoremen, they're the only ones out here with steady work and all they do is whine. Makes me sick. One of those bastards dragged me off the pier and... The police open fire into the crowd. As the shots ring out, the character of the sound changes altogether into terror and pain. No point dying for a day's work. The man crawls to the edge of the boxcar and hops off. The sound of gunfire continues all across the port. 
but the dense picket line remains unbroken. You see me here? You think you know me? I didn't start out in the gutter. I was raised right. Mama taught me to read off the Bible. But I'd save up my nickels for the collection plate and buy story rags instead. That smell of wood and paper. Hmm. But you tell me, what's the wildest thing you've seen on the roads out here? Anything good and exciting? Tell another like that and you could ride a good rag. Ah, uh, home. We lived in a little house in town, but the fields were never too far away. When my daddy'd run me out of the house, I'd beat it out to those fields and play cowboys and engines, or jump from a tree like a flyboy. So I miss them blood-pounding adventure stories. You got any like that? My blood's pumping. That's the kind I used to like as a boy. Well, we're talking about the rules. My daddy hated those rags. He whipped me good. Told me hard work's the only way to survive in this world. No use living in my head. But you tell me, what's the wildest thing you've seen on the roads out here? Anything good and exciting? That's the kind of adventure that sticks with you. I did my chores, said my prayers every day. I was a good boy. But in those rags, I was free. I could be whoever I wanted. So I miss them blood-pounding adventure stories. the past. I remember those stories better than what I did yesterday. Right now seems to slip away, but the past never leaves me. So I miss them blood-pounding adventure stories. You got any like that? <laughs> Travel? Those rags showed me everything travel could be. They took me all over the world. I sailed up the Nile in Egypt. I seen the Statue of Liberty and all those folks coming to America. All of it. My daddy wanted me to quit reading them rags. Said it kept me from hard work. Got his wish, but <laughs> he didn't get hard work instead. Anyway, I'm headed out this way when the sun comes up. I like your tales. Hope we cross paths again.
hard's terrain is broken and warped, as though some great worm has rustled the earth beneath it. Graves jut out at odd angles from the rolling ground. And somewhere deep among the graves, a voice rings out. You can't make out the words. They're made of unfamiliar vowels and clipped sounds. A language you don't speak. The voice is clear and sonorous. Feminine. It sounds like a chant or a summons. You finally see her at the top of a hillock, next to a fresh grave. Her straight figure makes her seem like an antique pillar, standing with her shoes in grave dirt, clad in an austere dress that seems too much like a suit of armor. Her eyes are blocked out by a dark, velvet blindfold, and the cross before her is adorned with curious serpentine horns. Blindfolded and deafened by her song, she doesn't notice as you approach, close enough to see the detail of her face. Her recitation comes to an end. A rustling surrounds you, fireflies in the air, winking out and falling to the ground and moss. The grass turns brown beneath your feet. A bird impacts the ground near you like a missile. It's as if your throat has blocked up, as if your lungs have lost the strength to hold air. Sunglasses stands beside the smoking wreck of a sleek looking Ford. In the distance, a violet arc of lightning blurs the edges of your vision. Shit! Don't get to those unusual or. The barrel droop. The cards feel warm in your hands. Clubs, spades, hearts flash in his eyes. And then wands, swords, Cups. The sign hangs on a run-down wooden fence. Apple trees. Planted in neat r- You hop the f- Rows and rows of inedible fruit.
spent a half hour filling you in on his plans to drive coast to coast. Enthusiasm radiates off him. When he talks, you hear the blare of the motor, feel the wind ruffle your hair, taste the tang of oil on the breeze. But why he dresses like a racer is beyond you. Of course! Where's the joy in driving if you don't look the part? He slips off a glove and has you feel how soft it is. Driving really is the only way to travel. Yes, yes! The people around here don't get it. If you're ever along the mother road, keep an eye out for me. He laughs. Oh, friend, I would love to show you, but that's for another day. She shakes her head. Factory's never going to reopen. Wading through an overgrown field, you nearly step on someone lying in the tall grass. Despite your boot above their face, the reclining individual doesn't flinch. Instead, as you stumble backwards, they coolly call out. You drop your pack and stretch out beside them, soaking up the late afternoon sun. The long stalks of the weeds rise above your eyes like great trees. Sure, honey. I know an outsider when I see one. Take clothes, for example. Why is a fella in a dress only ever a joke? They nod. Everything is man or pink, white, magenta, and blue flowers dot the field. Ha! That's a good question. You reassure them that they stand. Sounds and smells of Runciter's Circus assault you as you step through the awning. A paunchy man in a green bowler hat rushes over and grabs you by the arm. Finally! I'm John Runciter. I expected detectives an hour ago. Muckaboy found it this morning. Through here. He steers you off the concourse into a white tent that stinks of piss and wet fur. Two banks of dirty cages crowd the space. Runciter points to one at the end. There. A scrap of tape above the cage reads, Sitka, the tiger is dead. There are no marks or wounds on its body, but a thick white foam coats its mouth. You see? He says, Somebody's trying to ruin me. A quick search of the cage shows no signs of interference. At the back, you spot a plastic container lodged behind the bank of cages. It's unlabeled. He grunts. Fire breathers use it as part of their routine. It's a mix of alcohol and, uh, something. Safe, unless you swallow it. You think... He turns as two police officers enter the tent. Mr. Runciter, we got your call. Hey! Runciter yells as you push past him. I catch you near my animals again, I'll put you in a cage and let's see.
The sun rises. You walk along the winding mountain path when you see a man approaching from the other direction, carrying something moving inside his long sleeves. The man nudges his sleeves and says, Quiet, you. He notices your confused gaze. I caught this little rascal earlier. He had too much to drink. The man pulls out a beautiful mink. It struggles for freedom to no avail. Don't know what to do with it. I eh, suppose I'll skin him, get myself a new pelt. The mink stares at you intently. Small, round eyes crying for help. Reckon you have a better idea what to do with him? The man hands you the mink, bids his farewell, and disappears along the maze of mountain paths. You put the creature down and set him free. The mink, reunited with the earth, runs a few yards before turning around. He salutes you, holding his fist and palm. You follow the path forward, with the sun now beating down on you, climbing over some boulders and ducking under a fallen tree. The path you chose warps in every direction. Some time passes before a few steps later, you feel a wave of intense drowsiness. You feel a light tap on your right shoulder. Opening your eyes, you see a man. The man leads you along the road. You arrive at a small grotto along the side of the mountain. This is Miss Fox, and these are our brothers, and... Miss Fox interrupts the man with the stubby ears and helps you get seated. Oh, stop. No need for the pleasantries. We're all family here. The food is delicious. The sweet liquor hits the spot. See, you still don't recognize me? The man smiles and takes off his cap. He stares at you and tells streets. Come with me. You follow her to a simple inside after a wrap. A group of mechanics takes their lunch beside a broken locomotive. The welder grins while a reedy girl struggles to lift his tank of gas. It slips between her hands and thuds back down onto the mud. This is stupid. She, she thinks she can work with us. She got to prove herself, sneers one of the men. She wants lunch. She better prove herself. Wheezing, you lift the heavy tank. Look at you, snorts the welder. Show off. He pops the tank off your shoulder, saunters down the track. Yeah! Barks the girl. Not your business! Across the street from the jail, wave you over. Thank God you're here. The man is sweating profusely. I thought George hadn't come through for us. Another eyes you appraisingly. Not much brown on you. No need to play dumb, it's just us here. We can speak openly. The sweating man seems impatient. Your role has changed slightly. You'll still be the distraction, but it's gotten riskier. No time for that. The sweating man takes charge. We got the dynamite. We know the timings. The longer we wait, the riskier it gets. It's too early for the shops to be open, but a car is parked awkwardly outside the grocer's. 
the conspirators wouldn't guess what you're up to immediately. They won't hear what you say to the cop. Only note that you have, briefly, caught all the officer's attention. The policeman conceals his reaction with false concern. He calls another officer over to help you to a bench. His motionless beside the half-finished railroad tracks. A sheet covers his body only from his neck to his knees, revealing muscled calves and calloused feet. A group of men in prison stripes stands beside him. The sound of weeping carries on the air. We're paying our last respects to John Henry, one man tells you. He was the strongest man we had on the job. With the machines they're bringing in. He trails off. His heart just gave out. Happened to the rest of us prisoners sooner or later. Everyone working the line's a prisoner. Warden leased our labor to the sea and all, he says. I got picked up for vagrancy. That's what they call it when you're somewhere the white folks don't want you to be. Now I'm here, till they take my body back to the penitentiary. The old man sits on an upturned bucket, looking out over the tracks. His hands tremble, and his head shakes, but he is smiling. The growing dark and the efforts of a young station hand to send him home do nothing to deter him. The old man waves the boy away. That's it. You've nothing to fear. The old man winks. Keep me company? The others laughed, but... They all found reasons to leave. He chuckles, wheezes, and wipes blood from his mouth. I'm here to die. He takes your hand in his weak grip. Heard the whistle. 11.59. Thought I'd meet it at the station. Wouldn't want to make it late. He straightens his tie. Never been on a train I didn't work on. Nice to see what it's like. He sees you looking for the station clock and checks his watch. It's 11.55. Don't let me keep you. I don't know if they'll take extra passengers, but you might not want to find out. He looks anxious. He shakes your hand. Good luck in your travels. His attention is snatched to the track. He shouts as if compensating for loud noise. There it is! Go! You're rounding the corner when you hear a thump. The man has collapsed. attraction at the Runciter Circus restaurant is Nolly, the baby elephant who serves drinks. The diners whoop and applaud as she dangles a wine bottle, making a man jump for it. The woman taking orders comes to your table. The waitress calls out your order, and Nolly trumpets back. She sways slightly as she sets down your bottle. It topples and rolls off the table, forcing you to catch it. 
Nolly snorts. A laugh? The elephant can't keep a straight line on her way to the drinks trolley. A man reaches out to stroke her as she passes, and Nolly overbalances, staggering and collapsing onto a table. The waitress leans over Nolly, talking to her handler. She must have gotten the booze again. Weren't you watching her? Maybe. You're not supposed to drink. The crowd's enthusiasm hasn't dampened. The two haul Nolly to her feet. The elephant wafts her trunk and the crowd cheers. People throng the fair, filling the air with laughter and chit-chat. Kids thread and weave through the stalls, laughing, and not the cow is resplendent. It seems to glow in the sunshine, a winner's ribbon pinned on its bridle. And she a beaut, first in her category. The woman sat milking chimes in. She, she shrugs. Suit yourself. As you get closer, you see the patches on the cow's skin. Thick, irregular clumps of scales. The women exchange a look. She's a... The other cuts her off. You're a stranger. Thank you.